There he is. Yeah. yeah hi. hi. Hello, how are you? My camera. Uh, hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Hi. Hi, how are you? Welcome back. So, um... I'm just new here. Yes. Like, uh, I was interested in, uh, to contribute in a project which I found in Neurostars, which is about digital and microsystem. Okay. So, yeah, you've, uh, yeah, you've yeah. got the person here to talk to on that, too. Uh, Susan is collecting data on this, and she's bringing in uh, some of the data for people to work with. So, um, you know, why don't you introduce yourself? And Yeah, yeah. so my name is Hari Krishna, and uh, I'm currently a student at uh, Amrita University, and uh, I'm studying my uh, education. And, uh, and what are you studying? Yeah, yeah, I'm studying. And I'm currently at second semester of my course. Okay. okay, that sounds great. Um, and then it looks like Ishan is here. I've communicated with Ishan in the uh, Slack. Hi, uh, just give me a moment. Uh, I'm, I'm joining my laptop. Okay. Yeah, I'm just joining my laptop. Welcome, Hare Krishna. It's, uh, we usually have our meetings here. After Ishan introduces himself, I'll have Susan maybe talk a little bit about the digital microsphere, and then I'll go over some of the other stuff. My work pile behind me. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to say. Actually, hi. Susan. Oh. Okay. Oh, there it is. I can see that. This is a new yeah. version. Okay. And the microscope. So I put the microscopes in each, each of these. There's a hole. Yeah. Um, here's, here's, the, here's the So here's uh I'm sorry about the background noise here. Yeah. Just the microscope. I'll try to do this quick. If I can get it open. And there's the microscope. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You can buy them on Amazon. They're cheaper from the source. So they're uh -oh, somewhere between $50 and $100 Canadian. Okay. Uh -oh. Anyway, they fit. they fit in the hole. And they're, um, I don't know, they're, they're not that great a... Um, an individual camera on each of them, but since I'm putting 10 of them around uh, yeah. the circle, then yeah, you get an image of from all sides. So, yeah, the yeah. many of them take images like of the of the Android, which is near. yeah, you put them around just around yeah around the Android from all from all sides. Yeah, so, so basically what I have to do is like build a tool which will initially combine those to a 3D model, like a 3D sphere. And uh, also yeah. when the type parameter comes in, the data becomes full. And then there will be a, then I'm going to try to automate it. Just oh. with an Arduino and some uh, relays. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what else? Um, yeah, it's it's just I do not have the time to make a three D model of this. Uh, you could look into photogrammetry uh, as an idea for making three D models out of flat images. Okay. Yeah, that was my latest idea. Someone wanted to teach me photogrammetry, and they wanted like. Four hundred dollars Canadian, and I'm going. Um, no, I <laughs> don't. So many things, other things I have to do. I'm trying to do a PhD, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah, so I look into photogrammetry first. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Ishan, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
So, uh, I just introduce myself. So, uh, I'm Ishan. Uh, I'm currently doing my uh, computer science undergrad at Triple D Bangalore, India. And um, I'm actually doing a dual degree here. So, uh, I, I actually came across the INSEP project from my senior who has uh, worked here in the past uh, during his GSOC. So, uh, and I've been quite interested in computer vision lately. So, uh, I just found the project from the Neurostyles platform and I thought uh, maybe I'll try and uh, submit a proposal for the uh, GNN project yeah. or development network project. Um, and I had uh, I had looked at the uh, YouTube video which uh, uh, Bradley had sent on the uh, Slack channel and uh, uh, I'll be honest, it, it, it was a little bit overwhelming for me and I started going through uh, a, a bit of papers myself because I'm actually pretty new to, um, you know, the bioinformatics or uh, neuroinformatics in, um, let's say, machine learning because uh, I've only worked with image processing in the past. So uh, I was hoping, uh, you know, I could uh, learn more about the project and, you know, get some more insight into it because uh, as far as I know, there was uh, the YouTube video was just an overview, and since I, have, I haven't really attended any uh, meetings in the past, uh, I'm pretty new to this organization. So I was hoping maybe uh, I could get to know more here. Oh yeah, no, yeah, that's that's exactly why we have these meetings so that people can get uh, uh, sort of used to what's going on. So welcome. Um, I'm gonna actually go over some things on that uh, front. Today I'm also gonna we're gonna talk about a special issue we're doing for a journal, and then uh, probably papers. So uh, welcome Jesse and, and Dick and Karan uh, to the meeting. So uh, I'm gonna first thing I'm gonna do is go over some of the stuff uh, that we have, some of the resources we have for like code and uh, some of the data sets. Although I'm not gonna get into the data set so much today and then kind of giving you some background on some of the things we've been doing and then i'll talk about the special issue so let me share my screen here all right um i don't know can you see my screen Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, so this is our, uh, we have a site on ResearchGate and this has a lot of our papers on it. We have a website too, but this actually gives you like, uh, it goes to the PDFs of the papers. So we have a number of different papers here. There's a lot here. Um, if you're interested in the GNN project, we have a couple of papers that you might be interested in. Probably the most uh, important one for that is this paper, uh, Cell Differentiation Processes as a Spatial Network. And so this is, I believe, oh, this isn't right. This should give you, um, if you go to this, it's a little slow. Uh, this should give you an overview. There's a PDF here. All right, I think there might be somewhere in, in one of these. And it'll give you, um, infer I'll, at this link here, it'll give you information about this. We have an abstract and a paper. So, I mean, that's that's a paper that we've done. Um, and if you, you know, I know it can be over your head maybe because it's an academic paper or whatever, but if you have specific questions, uh, please, uh, you know, you can bring them up in the Slack, bring them up here in the meeting or whatever, we can answer them. Um, or I can answer them if it's uh, the network's work. Um, we have some work on connectomes as well. So there's the emergent connectome. Um, and there might be some other things in here that you might find interesting or inspiring from that point of view. Now we've been working, last couple of years we've been working on a number of projects having to do with like deep learning and um, machine learning techniques for looking at embryo data. So uh, we have this DivaWorm ML repository. I think someone might have asked about this on the Slack, what this is. And so this is the DivaWorm ML repository. This is like a series of, of uh, this was a series that we did in, I think, 2019, 
where we did a number, a series of classes or courses on different topics. So, you know, we did uh, current topics, existing tools, little five minute reviews, um, and we had a number of lectures. So this is the syllabus for the, it, it's maybe a little bit outdated now because this field is moving so fast, but we've had, we not only have here lectures on different um, topics, like for example, we have input data, pre-trained models for biology, um, TensorFlow tutorial. These were created by myself and, and a couple other contributors. Um, uh, Granny, are you sharing your screen? Because, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, we can't see yes. it. I, yeah. I thought it was. Let's see. Let me reshare it. I was having this trouble the other day, too. I don't know why. We see you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so uh, maybe I'll share the tab here. Um, so I'm trying to find out where I was here. Um, oh, I was on the Dvorm AI app. This is Dvorm AI. This can you see my screen? Yes. Like the, yes. yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, this is uh, Dvorm AI. This is a website that has a lot of things. So this is what the data look like. Um, you know, we have like uh, this type of microscopy data. So the idea is, is that you segment cells and you end up, you know, using some algorithm to segment cells and it brings uh, a number of different, or, or it brings numeric data out as the output. What we're trying to do in this project is maybe use some of the uh, deep learning algorithms and convert them to numeric uh, values and then model that using um, these uh, neural graph embeddings or these graph embeddings. And so there's a connection between so stuff. Maybe a uh, uh, feature extraction here. What was that? Is that it? Oh, feature extraction, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So we have a no yeah, these are a number of tools that we have for feature extraction. So, uh, you know, if you go through here, there are a number of data sets this links to. We've done some work with C. elegans, which is a, a nematode, which has a very, uh, it's a very good system to study if you want to see, look across the developmental process. There's also, that's the adult C. elegans here. Then you have this, um, this is the Bacillaria, which is a, a diatom, which is a, a marine microorganism, and they behave in colonies. And we've also done some uh, cell segmentation and feature extraction on these as well. This project will mainly revolve around C. elegans. So we have this, uh, we have some tools for C. elegans. Uh, we have uh, things in this Dvorm AI uh, site. We also have, um, I'm going to have to share my tab again. We also have our uh, Devo Learn software, which is a software that allows you to, you know, use a pre-trained approach to uh, feature extraction. So uh, where are we on this? Devo Learn is here. This is a yeah, there we go. So this is the Devo Learn repository. So this is a, a pre-trained model for um, using a deep learning framework, and it allows you to do that sort of feature extraction. So we have all these tools. The point being is that I wanted to um, expand upon that and go to these graph embeddings as a next step. So these graph embeddings can be integrated with, um, oh, hello, Jihang. Um, they can be integrated with, having trouble here with my camera, okay. They can be integrated with these deep learning algorithms or they can stand alone, but they're supposed to represent these, uh, these microscopy images. So we have, say, like, for example, an image of an embryo and we can do feature extraction. We have tools, existing tools to do that. And so 
What we want to do, though, is we want to create graph embeddings. They could be uh, tied closely with some of the tools that we have, where they could stand on their own and, and sort of use the, uh, the features that are extracted from these platforms and bring them into these graph embeddings, or be used to build the graph embeddings. Um, now, there was another question on the Slack about, um, about whether this is a research tool or an engineering tool. So whether it's like something that we'll just use for like extracting things or whether we want to build a pipeline. Um, and so the answer is, is that nominally we want it to be a research tool. We want to just build a, some sort of library of graph embeddings based on some of these uh, data sources that we have. And I'll make the data sources available in the Slack. I don't have them at my fingertips right now. I'll just send you the links to some of the data that we have. We have some standard data sets that we've used for some of these other projects. Um, you know, they include uh, embryogenetic data sets like um, in C. elegans. We have some other data sets. Some of them are easier to work with. Some of them are harder to work with. So this is something you can decide on what you want to use. Uh, you know, there are various ways you can use data. So you can use them to benchmark things. You can use them as like a training set. Um, I've hit, you know, we've had uh, students go out and find other data sets that are publicly available. Um, and so I can put together a list of data sets that you would want to use, because that's going to be an important part of this is to get uh, data sets. And I don't know, you know, maybe using the right data sets, you can build better embeddings, but um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. This this project in part is going to rely on people sort of coming up with an answer. So I'm not going to be able to give you a specific set of instructions on how to do this. This is something you, you know, I want people to sort of think about the best answer for. So if you're um, looking to do this project, know that we have these uh, resources. We have the different types of uh, machine learning feature extraction algorithms that exist now. So you can actually build those into your project or you can uh, go and, you know, sort of develop on your own. You have data sets that are available. And then that DivaWorm ML um, repository, I don't want to go back to that because it's kind of uh, important, I think, from a educational standpoint. Um, the thing about what we did here was we did a, a number of topics. So we did like, um, we talked about input data. We talked about, um, uh, pre-trained models. We talked about, we had a TensorFlow tutorial. We had a, uh, computational pareidolia. So we covered some really offbeat topics. But a lot of these topics actually fed back into the biology and sort of the approach we're taking in this group, which is that we're looking at developmental biology, but we're also looking at um, computation and, and machine learning and a lot of different computational techniques. So like we have game theory and machine learning and development. And that's a, you know, a lecture where we're tying machine learning to uh, game theory and development and kind of talking about GANs and things like that. So there's a lot of that sort of thing um, if you're interested. And that might guide you as well in terms of the types of um, approaches you want to take or, you know, the types of things we're thinking about. Because we don't, I mean, we're taking, we, <laughs> this isn't something that's, uh, you know, sort of the typical approach. We're, we're a multidisciplinary group and our, our goals are mainly for research, but we also have an interest in building pipelines. But I think for this, for the GSOC project, I think the first priority is sort of a research orientation where, you know, you're trying to build these graph embeddings uh, for this sort of set of tools that we already have. So it kind of fits into that. And then, you know, we might be interested in building a pipeline secondarily. Um, I, I talked last week about... Um, Tohi, which is a, a a way to automate pipeline building pipelines, and uh, this is something that one of our former contributors, or he's in the group still, but he hasn't uh, been active much lately. Uh, Krishna Katyal, he uh, is working for this company 
and he's working on these uh, ML pipelines. And, you know, they have a whole library of things where, you know, they have different algorithms and different pipelines. So we might actually end up, uh, if you're interested, we might, and this could be beyond the scope of the GSOC project, integrate your project with those pipelines. So there are a lot of options here. Um, I, you know, I'll be in touch with people as we go along and I want to, you know, share things with you like data sets and things like that to help you get started on your project proposals. So, I mean, the, the first thing, you know, to do is, I guess, just kind of think about a project proposal. Think about how you would, you know, how you would approach the problem, you know, what kinds of resources you want to bring to bear. Um, I'll put some of those links in the Slack after the meeting so that we have them, so you have them, you can reference back to them. And then um, that may give you some guidance on some of the parts of the uh, proposal where you're unsure. So I'm happy to look over people's proposals as they work on them. I mean, probably, you know, you'd want a first draft before I see it, where you lay out the problem, you maybe do a little bit of a demo. You say what tools you'll be using. I mean, if you want to use TensorFlow or PyTorch, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to. In fact, I encourage it because we have, you know, those those uh, platforms or those packages are kind of proven, you know, that they, they work. So we know how, you know, we, we kind of know how they work. And it's it's uh, more valid, I think, than building your own tools from, from the ground up. But then once you work inside those uh, you know, platforms, you can then build your own algorithms, you can tie them into other things. Um, did you have any questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. I have one question. Yeah. Um, oh. so, uh, so I wanted to ask if uh, the uh, feature extraction graph, graph embedding model should be uh, integrated in the Devlin library or would, would we be creating a separate library for this? Uh, this would probably, well, I mean, it, it it's probably going to be separate, at least to begin with. Although if you wanted to build it into that, that would be okay. I, I would really, I think it would be probably better if we had it as a separate thing though for GSOC because mm -hmm. um, they want to see like, they want you to be able to, uh, when you submit your project, you download the program and they want to be able to execute it. So, you know, I mean, just to, uh, to uh, not run into any dependency problems, then probably we'd want to do it as a standalone thing. Yeah, that's, uh, that answers my question. Okay. Dick, you had a question? Uh, Brad, yeah. Bradley, yeah, can yeah. I make a comment? Uh, I was a few minutes late, so I'm not sure if you covered this. Uh, in addition to photogrammetry, which is usually for close up earth based airplanes. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the other way to look at the problem is that uh, embryos primarily visible on the outer surface and they're very close at the beginning stages to a sphere, which means that any software that's been used for making maps of the earth, which is very close to a sphere, may be applicable. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, uh, and that's a different kind of photogrammetry because you have to take it to account the curvature of the Earth. Right. Yeah. Okay. So checking the literature on how that was done, because it's been done for many decades already. Yeah. Uh, may, may be worthwhile. Yeah, that's for the... Yeah, yeah I look into that one. Digital yeah. micro But any satellite view, at, yeah, at best gives you one hemisphere, where it just gives you a close-up. Part of the earth. Yeah. How do you how do you montage things that are images of a sphere onto a sphere? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now we have we have experimental methods that both give you the angles and some that don't. So you not only have to montage them, you have to register them. If you use the algorithms that don't tell you what angle you can. Yeah. Okay. Susan has worked on both kinds of uh, microscope. Okay. Any comments? 
Um, I think the one that I've got now um, doesn't give you as detailed a, a picture because it's a low pixel microscope basically, but um, you know where it is. It's fixed. So I'm hoping okay. that, that that will work. Okay. okay. Do what? Um, well, they're 90 degrees to each other. Microscopes are uh, 90 degrees oh, to each other on the sphere. Um, I do have a top and bottom one as okay, well. Okay, but the accuracy, uh, what's the accuracy in measuring the angle? Um, I don't know. <laughs> No. <laughs> I, uh, because when I'm focusing in on the embryo or um, my object, I move the microscopes around quite a bit. So they, they will be at different angles, even though it's 90 plus 3 degrees, say, and yeah, the yeah, next one will be 89 degrees, um, but they will be fixed. Yeah, it depends on the accuracy of the robots, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I've done some sub-pixel imaging of diatoms, so I know it's possible. Okay, and it might be possible with these also. Okay. So even though Susan's uh, not the maximum resolution you'd like, you might you might be able to get some sub-pixel resolution out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm still waiting for salamanders. It's bad. Always the bottom of the neck. Yes. Of, uh, of, uh, our uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. For those of you who don't know, uh, Susan's using axolotls, which is a salamander from Mexico. It's called Ambistema mexicana. Uh, and it, in a sense, it never grows up in that it retains the larval form and lives underwater and also breeds underwater. Okay. Whereas normal salamanders come out onto land. Okay, and this is a, a fairly common laboratory. It's been around about 200 years. Yeah, I'm relying on uh, Elizabeth's salamanders to lay eggs. Okay. And <laughs> take they them are not so, so far. Take them for a car ride. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell her. <laughs> see, inspire them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, next thing I wanted to talk about was the special issue. Um, let me share my screen again. Um, and this is the special issue. Uh, so this is a special issue of the journal Cells uh, for a topic. Um, open up. So continuing with this. Um, Go, uh, discussion of uh, networks. This is a proposed title was Approaches to Developmental Network Structures. Um, now, Dick and I talked a little bit about this last week. I know Susan, I didn't, we really didn't get together on this as, as, a, as the three of us because it listed you as a uh, editor, co editor. Um, so I, I'd like to hear your feedback on this. I know you got the email, but we haven't met in person on this. So or virtually. So the title is Approaches to Developmental Network Structures. Um, and I tried to be very broad on that. Um, some of the stuff it, uh, relates to some of the network uh, work that we've been doing in this group, like on complex networks. Uh, some of the work is focused on uh, like some of the things we're doing with um, tensegrity and, and other types of topics. So. Um, this will focus on networks and their role in the representation and actual, actual usage in the developmental process. Networks are a powerful methodology that allow us to analyze, understand, and visualize complex developmental processes. As complex systems, developmental processes have many interacting components with spatio-temporal structure at multiple scales, both intracellular and extracellular. So to understand the structure, we must look beyond standard correlative and statistical approaches. So this is where networks are useful, understanding the heterogeneous structure of network topology, 
we can gain a broad overview of how the adult phenotype emerges from a generally spherical egg. And so we're interested in things as wide ranging as uh, different machine learning approaches that use graphs, uh, structural models of embryo physics, tensegrity networks, uh, I guess gene regulatory networks, signaling networks, and then uh, complex network analysis and theory. And so that's, that's kind of the broad network casting here. Uh, so the topics include tensegrity structures, ordered developmental graphs, uh, including lineage, lineage trees and differentiation trees and graph theory more generally. So, you know, something that's an ordered graph that describes development. Um, divergent developmental network structures, um, developmental graph embeddings, embryo networks and connectomics, graph dynamics and temporal rewiring, connecting genetic and morphological networks, developmental hypergraphs and role of horizontal gene transfer. Those are all possibilities. And so we have a couple of papers kind of listed here. Uh, Dick proposes this paper, a call for a modern test of Williamson species fusion hypothesis. This involves a, an evolutionary tree. So this would be a sort of an ordered graph. Um, I'm also planning to contribute a paper. I still haven't come up with a title on what it's going to be, but I'm going to put that in there. And then I guess if Susan wants to put in a paper or if you know of someone who wants to put in a paper, I'm not really sure how many papers we need to have. I emailed the person who's doing the special issue, the organizer of it. She says it just won't be made public until you get like a certain number of papers. But like, you know, we, we should send this to her to, to give her sort of a heads up about her intentions. Yeah. And so that's that's where we are with that. Yeah, Bradley, uh, her March 7th deadline, I think we should take as a list of what proposed table of contents uh, and contact the people afterwards. Yeah, yeah. It would be okay. kind of hard to get okay. us. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, it's hard to get commitments in right. a few days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, sounds like a good start. Yeah. Okay, so maybe start circulating that between between the three of us. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will have a paper on tensegrity. Oops. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's. I figured you'd probably have something like on that topic. Um, and I can just put. We can just put in like the. A placeholder title. I don't think we need to have. Yes, of course. Yeah. Tentative, tentative. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's good. That they'll that'll hopefully move forward, and we can. Uh, okay. Uh, have you and, or Su and Susan decided who's going to be lead editor? Um. I mean, I could be lead editor. I guess. Um, unless okay. you want to do it, Susan. Susan? Susan, do you want to arm wrestle him? <laughs> oh, she said uh, she might be happy. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, yeah, it's, yeah, it, well, we'll see. <laughs> any, any order is fine with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that looks good then. Uh, see, for you younger people, uh, my career no longer depends on uh, my publications, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in case you're wondering why I'm going up and down, it's because I'm on a treadmill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, a couple other things I wanted to mention about the network stuff. Uh, we do have some talks on this, and I almost forgot to... They're not on the research gate, but I can post them to the Slack channel. Hari Krishna, are you on the Slack, on the OpenWorm Slack? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. I just joined today. All right, that's good. I'll, I'll send you a welcome message, and then I'll, I'll post things in um, either the Diva Worm channel or we have a Diva Learn channel. And the Diva Learn channel is, we were yeah. using it sort of for... Um, you know, like Diva will learn specific things, but we might actually use that as well for some of the um, 
some of these other things that are, uh, you know, specific to these projects. So I'll, I'll be posting and I'll be, I'll be tagging people and you'll be getting messages on this. Pointers to things. Okay, Brad, let, yeah. me, let me throw out a, uh, a brain twister for you. Okay. Uh, okay. Ken, is there any way that we can bring Michael Levin's uh, work on bioelectricity and development into a network uh, structure? Uh, well, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I know that stuff he does with uh, bioelectricity, it's basically looking at cells. I mean, some of the stuff he does is like the cells are working together to sort of coordinate like regeneration or morphogenesis, and they're having to coordinate their electrical activity. So that's a network of like coordination network of some type where... Okay, think about it. Yeah. I don't know if you can get Michael to do it, but maybe, yeah. maybe we could challenge him by somebody else to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I know he's got me out. <laughs> he's a sharp guy, very well mathematically trained. Uh, and I've uh, been trying for years to get him in, but uh, no luck so far. Yeah. He's making interesting discoveries. So yeah. Uh, yeah. incorporating bioelectricity, in, you know, it's been in development. There was a book on bioelectricity and development in, I think, 1949. And uh, electrical measurements go back well, at least 120 years or so. Yeah. Okay, so people have been concerned about it, but it's never been integrated properly into bio, into development of biology. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of in the category, unless you measure it electrically, it's in the category, if you can't see it, you ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does it change the colors of some of the dyes that are used in microscopy? Oh, you have to check. You have to check his his uh, papers. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, why don't we move on to? Uh, let's see. We have some. I wanted to go over maybe some of the things. Uh, we do have some submissions that we. I want to go over that. I don't think it's been updated too recently, but um, I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to go to the our submissions document, which, again, I'm not sure it's been updated re recently, but let's see what's there. So we have, this is the way we work on this, uh, you know, we work in this way where we review these things at the meeting, and then we kind of follow up on them, and, and uh, you know, we see what gets done. There are various deadlines for conferences and books, and other types of or journals now you know we have a special issue we have to organize that as well so um so we have a number of different things that are outstanding um these are projects that have been proposed and you know we're looking for collaborators on them so this is you know independent of the uh summer or code projects or you know these are just things that kind of we're always looking for a venue for them uh, so the test of Williamson symbiosis, this is the one that we talked about perhaps for the special issue. So I'll update this. And uh, this is something that's been a longstanding uh, topic that Dick and I have discussed on looking at this idea that um, uh, organisms have developmental programs from different uh, parts of the evolutionary tree and they get expressed in different parts of development. So you know, this is something that could be tested if people are uh, interested, you know, if they have a background in genomics, uh, they can, uh, you know, look at different genomes from different organisms and do like blast searches to match up um, potential genes that are shared. And, you know, maybe there's some relationship there. So, well, you know, you'd have to, read up about Williamson symbiosis hypothesis uh, and then you know you'd have to do these empirical tests it would be a, a lot of bioinformatics um, then there are these molecular level simulations of diatom motion jerkiness so we've okay, been uh, yeah yeah I think you can take that off the list because uh, I'm now doing a revision based on reviewers okay so that's okay off. so it's it's it, it'll be in press. Oh, okay. But uh, no further development on it. Yeah. Um, 
And then there's this uh, diatom movement smoother jerky. This is again, we're working with these diatoms and they're nice organisms because they can be cultured, you know, as well as C. elegans. They, they can be cultured somewhat easily. And when I say that, I don't mean that they can be cultured easily. I mean that they can be cultured more easily than some of our other model organisms. But you can observe them under a microscope and get nice data uh, on their movement. And so we've done some work on the movement, um, characterizing it uh, using machine learning techniques. And this is actually looking at whether the movement is smooth or whether what they call it, what they call jerky, which is where you look at the acceleration of the of the uh, cells moving in a colony, and uh, you'd have to be able to like detect that movement. You'd have to break down the, the video of the micro uh, micros, uh, microscopy video into different um, frames. You'd have to resample it and then determine whether it's you know movement is smooth or whether it exhibits variations along its path. Um, Brad, on that, the real question about smooth is that uh, uh, Thomas, Harbage, <coughs> excuse me, Thomas Harbage thinks that vasillaria might be smooth. He's not absolutely sure. Okay. So the smooth question goes back to vasillaria. All right. If the words that will be different from uh, what are called the viculite species that we observed, which are jerky. Okay. So right. you might put the word vasillary up for soon. All right. So there, we have lots of films of vasillary, so the data is available to analyze. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of the data, uh, you know, it, it comes in video form. So you have like a number of different uh, images sort of in a time series. And then you have to basically find like, you know, you have to find features of, uh, there are these long elongated cells and you have to find, you know, you do some sort of feature detection to find the centroid or, you know, some marker that you can use to track cells across images. So. The idea would be that you'd have these cells and they'd, you'd be able to track them over time and see how they move in their displacement. And so if the displacement is, you know, forms a smooth trajectory, then that's smooth. And if it forms something that's highly yeah, variable, then that's a jerky that trajectory. What oh, was that? Yeah, uh, that would be important to know for vasillaria especially. Uh, one of the things we did when we found single cells is we used the shell itself as the marker. Okay? Yeah. The whole shell. And with that, we were able to get sub-pixel resolution. Okay. Okay. So uh, if you go back to the bacillaria, and instead of putting them in a rectangle, you, you get the outline of each cell, you might be able then to do sub-pixel resolution and determine how smooth the motion is. Yeah. All right, so that's um, that's for that. Then we have uh, some work on quantitative comparisons of archaea and shaped droplets, and this is something that um, uh, Maya presented in our group um, back, I think, earlier in the year, a couple weeks ago, and uh, this is something that is sort of a takeoff from the DevilLearn stuff. He's using computer vision to characterize different shapes of uh, droplets, like water droplets and archaeobacteria, and using sort of the, you know, feature detection algorithms, not the same ones in DevilLearn, but some other ones, to make those kind of uh, quantitative assessments. And so, you know, some of these things might be relevant to networks as well. So um, I think we got, we had an update a couple weeks ago, so it looks like that's moving along. Uh, it's not, I don't know if it's on track to be uh, submitted anywhere in any particular no, venue. It'll, it'll be a book. Uh, it, it's, it, it's large enough to warrant a book. Okay. And, uh, my plan is to submit it by about the end of the year. All right. 
then we had this uh, thing that we did at the first meeting of the year, 1D Ising, which is the 1D Ising model, which is this, uh, it's like a line and you have these uh, discrete cells that's change state. It's kind of like a, a model, of, well, that 1D Ising is a physical model, but we're thinking of building it as a Wolfram pattern generator, which is where you would have a sort of a cellular automata and mapping that into the... Now, uh, Tom Portagy said that he might be able to do this with Morphozoic, which is his software platform that he uses um, or that he built. But I have, you know, we haven't really followed up on that. I haven't followed up. I was going to, I think, follow up on some part of it. I think the aspect of the Wolfram uh, patterns is, you know, how they can be represented in different ways. But I never got around to that yet. So. <laughs> Right. Right. Let me make a comment in case yeah. anyone's interested in esoteric questions. Uh, Wolfram has uh, written this enormous book about 20 years ago uh, on the, the new physics based on his patterns. And uh, what the 1D Ising models as generators of these patterns raise is the question as to whether or not the Wolfram patterns are closed. That means is any pattern generated by something that's like a Wolfram pattern generator also uh, a subset of the of its patterns, or is it something new? And we don't know the answer to that yet. So if you've studied mathematics and you know the concept of closed from mathematics, uh, then this is an interesting question, is whether Wolfram patterns are closed under Wolfram rules. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, Stephen Wolfram. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Stephen, yeah, Stephen Wolfram. And that's especially important if his notion that these patterns are basic to physics is correct or not. The rules closed. <laughs> yeah, closed or open. Yeah. Or open, yes. <laughs> um, right. yeah. And then this divergent integration, uh, this, is, this has to do with the network stuff that we've been talking about. And this is going to be a... a an abstract submitted to NetSci 2022. So that's a conference that's happening this summer. Um, it's going to be virtually, held virtually. And the deadline for that is March 11th. So I'm working on that uh, abstract. I'll probably, hopefully get it done by next meeting. Um, I've got a lot of things on my plate right now. So I'm a little slow on some of this stuff. But um, this, this will be something that I think if you go to our YouTube site, and I might put a link, I'll probably put a link to this in the Slack. This discusses sort of some of the vision for what we want to do with networks in development. And so I, I, I've given talks yeah. on this before. It's just that I want to, you know, every time we do a conference, I want to give something new. So um, that's why I'm like having to reformulate the. Can, can you send that, that abstract or link to me at some point? Either, I know I'll be in the Slack, but if it's not here, I'm curious about, about that one. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to, when I get it done, I'll send it out. Um, or when I get to, like, a draft word. Add, add, add the special issue. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that might be something. I'm not sure what the title will be, though. But something involving that Networks. concept. Yeah, you can make it short. Networks and develop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, in fact, it raises a curious question. If you look at the standard views of development, and you look at the differentiation tree development, they're actually at two opposite extremes. In the differentiation tree, there are no anastomoses between branches. No, there are no connections between the branches. In the standard view, that's all you've got, is connections and the, and the, the tree doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, a, an assessment of how important are anastomoses in development versus clean trees is would be an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, you talked about that before, so that's yeah, that would be an interesting question. Um, yeah, I'll follow up on that. I'll, I well, just okay, yeah, I, I just I just realized the, the, the difference is is that the, all the people believe that it's all down to gene regulatory networks, basically believes any cell can communicate with any other cell and therefore all anastomoses are possible. <laughs> and they ignore the lineage tree. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Whereas the differentiation tree view is very much based in lineage trees. Okay. Yeah. The truth may be in between. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how do you assess that? Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> hard. So yeah, any questions at this point? Uh, we have some things in the chat here. Um, yeah, Jesse says, I have a very, very slight means of contacting Levin. Yeah, Jesse lives in Boston, so he might, but I don't, yeah. Uh, and then, um, okay. So if you have to go, Jesse, thanks for attending the meeting. Uh, now I'd like to switch to our papers. We do papers at the end of the meeting, you know. I'll be doing this for about 15 or 20 minutes, so if you have to leave at the top of the hour, that's okay. I just wanted to have enough time to go over a few papers here. Um, so we have like this large pile of papers here, and thank you, Dick, for sending along papers. I, I have some of them in here. Um, I'm not sure what we'll do this week. What was that? No, go ahead. Okay. So a couple of weeks ago, we uh, talked about Daisy World and uh, like a model of Daisy World, which is this model of uh, planetary regulation uh, based on things like albedo and some other factors, you know, uh, organismal phenotypes. So the idea of Daisy World is you have this single organism that takes over the surface of the planet and it has a certain colored phenotype. And that colored phenotype then affects the planet, planet's atmosphere by uh, setting the albedo or the reflectance of sunlight at a certain amount. And then that contributes to the uh, temperature of the planet's atmosphere. And so if you change the, if you uh, change the, uh, and this is thought of as uh, a bunch of daisies covering the world, but it could be any organism that covers the surface of the planet. If you change the color of those phenotypes, those colors will change the albedo and change the atmosphere. Um, if you have heterogeneity, so if you have uh, daisies or organisms of multiple colors, they change, you know, they compete for dominance or they uh, fall into a equilibrium and that also affects the environment. So this is important to early life where you had microbes that were actually doing things like converting uh, some, uh, atmospheric chemicals and other atmospheric chemicals. And you had them at such a, uh, in a, to such an extent, single species, that they actually changed the atmosphere. And so there are a couple of things that I wanted to follow up on with Daisy World. Um, the first one is this uh, paper on, it's a uh, sort of an artificial life type paper. It's uh, environmental regulation can arise under minimal assumptions. So this is, again, this idea of environmental regulation from Daisy World. Um, and so the abstract reads, models that demonstrate environmental regulation as a consequence of organism and environment coupling all require a number of core assumptions. Many previous models, such as Daisy World, required that certain environmental altering traits have a selective advantage when those traits also contribute towards global regulation. We present a model that results in the regulation of a global environmental resource through what they call niche construction without employing this and other common assumptions. There is no predetermined environmental optimum towards which regulation should proceed, assumed or coded into the model. Uh, polymorphic stable states that resist perturbation emerge from the simulated coevolution of organisms in an environment. Um, and then they talk about different state, multiple stable states resulting. Regulation is achieved through two main subpopulations that are adapted to slightly different resource values, which force the environmental resource in opposing directions. This maintains the resource within a comparatively narrow band over a wide range of external perturbations. So this, this is basically the Daisy World model where you have multiple species that are sort of co-evolving and they're actually maintaining this um, dynamic equilibrium between them. So they don't, one doesn't overtake the other, they kind of exist, coexist. And they come up, they talk about this concept called niche, niche construction. And so niche construction is a, a newish idea. Uh, this was Kevin Lalonde um, 
in, back in the 90s who proposed this. And this is a, a different, it, it's sort of part of the evolutionary, um, um, the sort of the extended synthesis of evolution. And so this is a, a mechanism for driving evolution that comes from the environment. And so um, this is referred to as niche construction. Um, so, okay, so um, it talks about how these organisms, you know, it talks about some, uh, an example of, uh, let's see, for example, burrowing earthworms change the composition of local soil, whereas the amplification of silicate rock weathering by plant life has resulted in re the reduction of atmospheric concentration of CO2 by 10 to 100 times. Without the latter effect, the surface temperature of the earth would be much higher, perhaps in excess of 50 degrees centigrade. So this is the effect that's called niche construction, which is that organisms will start living in an environment and modify the environment. And then that modification changes the conditions. So if you think about, if you know anything about beavers in North America, they do this. Um, ants and termites will do this with termite mounds. They build large mounds, but they can actively change the environment in which they live. They can change the properties of it. And so they, you know, they can build structures, they can do all sorts of, humans of course do this a lot, where you're building these structures and you're actually influencing this, this sort of the, the environment around the organism. So this is something that, you know, is, they work out this, this um, and they actually get into some of the uh, population genetics of it. So we talked about that population genetics paper uh, a couple weeks ago, where they talk about the population genetics of Daisy World. And they talk about how this sort of niche construction actually involves some population genetics that kind of is consistent with this idea of co-evolution and co uh, sort of coexistence of multiple polymorphs. So that's one paper. Um, the other paper, another paper is this it's Wilkins in 2003. And this is catastrophes on Daisy World. So this is a little bit about how you can have catastrophes in this system. So, you know, the system is what they call highly regulated. So you get this regulation that emerges from these organisms kind of living on the planet and changing the conditions of the planet. Uh, but you can also have catastrophes, which are sudden collapses of the uh, world and its, and its environment. And so, you know, how does that work? Does the population crash or what happens? Uh, so there's this research tradition that's been based on daisy world models, which have a strong coupling between life and the abiotic environment. Um, this is a new paper in this tradition shows that how small changes in external forcing can lead to catastrophic environmental change on this virtual planet. So this is something that, again, it's this sort of catastrophism where you have this small uh, perturbation uh, and it's not consistent with the effect that it has on its system. And so they kind of talk about c catastrophes in uh, Daisy World. This is interesting because, you know, if you're, you're thinking about like uh, something like cybernetic regulation, you know, it's always interesting to figure out kind of how these uh, nonlinear effects propagate through the system. And so this is a very much, this new study by Ackland et al, and new meaning when this paper was published, has introduced curvature into the CA World Daisy World CA Daisy World models. This is cellular automata. They build a Daisy World out of a cellular automata, and they're able to incorporate variation in the input of solar radiation across the grid. And so you have these uh, this variation in inputs, and these variations in inputs sometimes lead to these catastrophes. So it's not just a matter of like, um, you know, it's it's something you wouldn't expect necessarily. You can't necessarily predict it. But you get this paper from Ackland et al. was entitled Catastrophic Desert Formation in Daisy World because they found that when solar luminosity increases to a critical value, a desert formed across the wide band of the planet. So you have these phase transitions, which are or analogies to phase transitions, where you get this abrupt change from different one state to another. Um, then there are, you know, these other issues with in terms of regulation, uh, Daisy World actually resembles something called a rain control. And this is something from cybernetics that um, I've actually wrote a blog post on about 10 years ago. 
Um, so this is uh, a review of Daisy World. They talk about Daisy World um, just as the model itself. And then they talk about sort of, you know, these feedback systems that are basically what Daisy World is. And so they talk about rain control and how that's important in regulating this model. And so uh, rain control is, is where you have, it's kind of like the reins of a pack animal or a horse. And I did this post on it about 10 years ago where uh, I talked about this paper where they looked at diabetes as a rain uh, control system. And so there's this, uh, so the concept of rain control dates to pre-automotive eras, uh, the pre-automotive era, when a driver would control their team of horses or some other pack animal in order to get wagons or other payloads from place to place. The driver would use two reins or guide wires, so one on the right, one on the left, that were independently coupled to the team of animals in front. Pulling on the reins in different ways would result in a very crude form of steering, controlling direction or speed. And so in physiology, you can use this model as a model of control and of regulation. So in physiology, rain control exists on two entities, A and B, which could be gene products, paracrine signaling or hormonal release, act upon the same target. So the target being the, the thing that you're trying to control, or in this case, maybe the horse. Um, and then you would pull, say like on the left rein, or pull on the right rein, or pull on both of them at the same time, and it would result in some sort of control. It's not, uh, you know, it's not deterministic control because there is, you know, you, it isn't like a direct control. You're just kind of pulling back and you don't know if you're pulling back hard enough. In, a, in the physiological context, you know, there might be uh, one pathway that's activated, but if it's not activated strongly enough, it doesn't really have much of an effect. Another pathway might be activated in the same way or both pathways would be activated and it has different effects on the system, different control effects. So it's basically two feed forward signals uh, trying to control the system at once or in maybe independently. So examples of this are a compensatory effect when both entities A and B act upon the same target, a loss of function where one of the source entities A or B fail, as in diabetes where the beta cell shut down. So one of these reins you know, doesn't function anymore. And so you either can control the system with a single rein or, you know, you can't. Um, now, sometimes these reins are, you know, redundant. And if in that case, then you don't have a problem. If one fails, then you just use the other one. But in diabetes, A and B are different things. And so when you lose A or when you lose B, you can't control the system very well. Uh, in cases where the number of entities is more than two, we will see much more complex dynamics. In particular, we should see many synthetic and subadditive effects. So this is where A plus B is larger than C or A plus B is smaller than C. So that means that you have like these reins A and B that you know can't control C as well because they don't add up to controlling C and A plus B maybe over control or over determine C. And so those are kind of interesting cases as well. And so this was a, a couple of papers on, on physiology and diabetes. And then there's this paper on Daisy World where they kind of propose a similar thing in this review. They propose rain control as a means to control the Daisy World um, and, its, and its operation and its stability. So the, inter the, the thing, main thing they're interested in here is stability of a system. And you know, what does it take to maintain that stability over time? And so, you know, you can use a lot of different approaches. You can use differential equations. You can use other types of things. But at the end of the day, it's really just about making sure that that stability is maintained. And in many cases, and we can draw from complex systems or we can draw from uh, control theory or cybernetics, we see that there are different, you know, there are different ways that can happen in different ways that that can change. And so I thought that was interesting, of interesting follow up on that simple model. Um, let's see, um, I think, actually I might talk a little bit about this paper. This was, we talked about Levin earlier, Michael Levin, and of course he's done a lot of different papers. He's, I don't know how many papers he's published, a lot. 
Um, he's published uh, in the area of bioelectricity, so he's done a lot of work with that. He's also interested in this area of morphogenesis and applying, I guess you'd call them behavioral or psychological or cognitive models to morphogenesis. And so this is something he did with in conjunction with a couple of collaborators, including Carl Friston, who's another very highly published person in the area of uh, psychiatry and, and uh, neuroimaging. And this is a paper they did uh, back in 2020, Physics of Life Reviews. And it's morphogenesis is Bayesian inference, a variational approach to pattern formation and control in complex biological systems. So this variational approach is something that Carl Friston has advanced. They're doing this stuff with what they call active inference, which is a uh, framework to look at like how cognition emerges in the brain, or maybe not even in brains, but it may be in other complex systems. And, you know, it uses things like free energy and other types of uh, mathematical tools to sort of get at this question. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's one of these things where it's almost like active inference is almost like a, uh, where you have a hammer and you're looking for a nail, but it does, it is actually quite, I think, informative in a lot of ways. It, you know, so they wrote this article on what happens in embryos and, um, and so they go through this in the abstract. They talk about the wonders of modern biology. Um, and so we are now getting more increasing detail about molecular mechanisms underlying development and regeneration in biological organisms. However, an overarching concept that can predict the emergence of form and the robust maintenance of complex anatomy is largely missing from the field. So this broad, uh, like whole embryo approach, you know, explaining how you get the uh, emergence and form of anatomy. So they're not interested in gene regulatory networks. They're interested in sort of these massive, you know, these large scale, maybe networks or other things that are going on. Uh, classical approaches such as least action principles are difficult to use when characterizing these type of systems. These are open and far from equilibrium systems. These are, these predominate in biology and they are very different from the types of things that you would see in say like uh, chemical, um, in chemical kinetics, for example. Um, in this neurobiology setting, a variational free energy principle has emerged based on a formulation of self-organization in terms of what they call active Bayesian inference. So they use this approach, which is a Bayesian approach, which is where you calculate uh, conditional probabilities and you calculate these things and you try to figure out the world from that approach. And, Bayesian inference is actually a way to like look at evidence and evaluate it. Um, if, you, if you're interested in more, we can go over Bayesian methods. We have some tutorials on Bayesian methods, um, but, but you know, that this is a thing that you can't really do in like a single afternoon. You really need to dig into that. But they're, they're drawing from Bayesian inference here is the point. The free energy principle has recently been applied to biological self-organization beyond the neurosciences. So now they're going into these processes of development and regeneration. Um, the Bayesian inference framework treats cells as information processing agents. So each cell processes information um, where the driving force behind morphogenesis is the maximizations of a cell's model evidence. So basically the cells are processing information and each cell is taking evidence from the environment and they're maximizing the evidence of the environmental signals. So it could be like signals, like chemical signals, it could be signals from other cells, and it's maximizing its evidence of what's going on, and then it's making the appropriate decision. Should I differentiate? Should I go into this group of cells to form a tissue? These sorts of things. So that's what they're getting at with this. It's not so much that cells can think, it's that cells can process information and then they're evaluating evidence and integrating it into their behavior. This is realized by the appropriate expression of receptors and other signals that correspond with cells internal or generative model of what type of receptors and other signals it should express. So cells express receptors all the time in development and in adulthood. And they're, the fact that they're expressing receptors is sort of almost like a chicken and egg thing in some ways because it has to express receptors 
that then it needs to receive information. So in this approach, you know, it's getting information, it's determining what kinds of receptors to express, which means it can collect more information. And it can do all this in a way that's that leads to uh, developmental stability. So it's not expressing the wrong receptors. It's not, it may be making the wrong decisions at some point, but it's integrating all this information in a way that leads to something that looks like it's almost like programmed. But I think the point here is that it's not really programmed, at least in the conventional way that we think it is. Um, so then they talk about the free energy principle and pattern formation. This provides us with a quantitative formalism, formalism so it gives us this, this set of equations that we need uh, to understand this information processing. They derive a lot of mathematics behind Bayesian inference and in cells in this paper. Uh, and then they do some simulations to show that this formalism can reproduce experimental top-down manipulations of complex morphogenesis. So this is a first principle approach to morphogenesis. Um, and they also consider an aberrant signaling and functional behavior of single cells. Um, and then they also look at like first steps of carcinogenesis, which is the formation of cancer cells. And they think of the, they interpret that as a set of false beliefs about what a cell should sense and do. So they have this model of integrating information in cases where you have cancer, or you go down this cancer pathway, where cells differentiate from like some cell, it could be a differentiated cell, it could be a stem cell into a cancer cell. This is based on a set of false beliefs uh, about what the sh cell should be expressing. It's expressing maybe the wrong receptors or it's integrating its information wrongly. So this is kind of a weird way to look at it in, in some ways because it's, it's really kind of projecting maybe what humans are doing but it's also kind of a unique um, approach because it does give you this sort of, I know people in cell biology will use terms like, um, you know, signaling, and then they'll, they'll kind of get really anthropomorphic about it and kind of put it in the framework of humans exchanging messages. So, you know, I don't know if that's useful or not, but it's, uh, you know, it, at least it fits into that tradition. Um, we further show that simple modifications of the inference process can cause and rescue mispatterning of development and regenerative events. So if we go down to some of these images, and we usually do it this way, we go down to the images. Uh, well, it's not helping me. Um, see, there are a lot of equations in here, first of all. So that's a problem. But uh, might be a problem for some people. These are their example of their simulations. So they're simulating the cell from the head, the intestine, the pharynx, and the tail. And they're driving this from a flatworm, which is something that Levin works on. And uh, they show that this, this patterning happens in, in flatworms where you have this uh, programmatic, you know, you have this organization from head to tail. It's very much uh, regular across development. And you get this, uh, they were able to take, uh, in flatworms, you can do these interesting experiments where you can dissect out pieces of the flatworm. You can put them on a plate and you can get a whole new flatworm because all the cells are totipotent. They can all, each cell can generate a whole new organism. So they're actually able to look at some of the prediction and error of each cell as it's regenerating. Does it end up in the right place? And so they can show that this is exactly what happens. So they do things like this and they use a model organism which is actually amenable to this approach. So if you're looking at an even if you're looking at C. elegans, it might not necessarily be the case that this is what's going on. So but I thought that was an interesting paper since we brought up Levin. Um, looks like we have some messages here and we have people left. Ishan said thank you for uh, getting in touch on the project. Susan left. Uh, thank you for attending Susan and Ishan. And uh, derivative integral control, yes. It's, Susan's studying control theory, so um, yes. Jia Hong, thank you for attending. Nice to meet you. Yes. And Hare Krishna had to go. Thank you for attending. And uh, Jesse had to go as well. This is actually this last part, maybe Jesse's uh, in Jesse's wheelhouse, so I'll have to bring it up to him later. Oh, I'm still here. Uh, uh, the derivative integral control is just a standard um, 
method of controlling, say, a large plant or something. You yeah. Use both the, the uh, control formula and then I do a derivative and integration of of the resulting um, signal that's coming out to try to to keep the plant under control so it's not uh, exploding. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the one way to put that. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's from control theory. Yeah, I I know you've been studying control theory and, and other assorted things. So yeah, that was a while ago. Oh okay. But, okay, and thanks to uh, Dick for the deep learning assisted mechanotyping of individual cells. Oh okay. yeah. Um, I guess I could. I'll put it in the chat here. But I think. I have it. No, 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 it's not working. Oh, well, oh. Um, anyways, it, I read it and it's giving me some information about how to make cells with, with different um, cytoskeleton. You, you add, add some uh, toxins to the, the mix. Okay. Anyways, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. I, I'd like to, I'll pro try to go over that next week and we'll, we'll talk about it or bring it up. That would be good. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thanks for attending today and uh, talk to you next week. If you have anything you want to present on or bring up at the meeting, uh, let me know in advance or bring it to the meeting and talk to you next week. Thanks.